They they did use arsenic in the 20s and 30s, and it killed people. <laughs> so, you know. Welcome to Charlotte Mason Says. I'm John Chindell, here with my wife, Crystal. Join us as we read and discuss the home education series. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, we've already talked about a growing time, sightseeing, and picture painting. So today, we are talking about flowers and trees and living creatures. Which I thought, this actually broke down pretty well. Because flowers and trees and living creatures were, were very similar. And then next time, we're going to talk about field lore and the child gaining knowledge and then the child becoming familiar with natural objects. You mean I might have broken it down on purpose? I I mean <laughs> it's either that or you It was also about the right length. Right. I mean it's legitimately like ten pages each. But the sections break down pretty well. So this week we're talking about or we're starting with flowers and trees. Now we just finished, let's see, last week we finished talking about, let's, let's catch ourselves up here. We talked about out of door life for children. So it was growing time, sightseeing and picture painting. So get the children outside, get them doing outside things, get them studying the outside, taking mental pictures and images yep. and learning how to, learning how to see things. And so now we're going to look at what they are seeing. Yeah, what they're seeing. And so she starts off this first one, Flowers and Trees. She says, children should know field crops. In the course of this sightseeing and picture painting, opportunities will occur to make the children familiar with rural objects and employments. If there are farmlands within reach, they should know meadow and pasture, clover, turnip, and cornfield under every aspect of from the plowing of the land to the getting in of the crops. So basically, when you're walking them out to your your location that you are going to be, uh, let's see, uh, when you arrive at some breezy open wherein it seemeth always afternoon. So on your way to this place, that seemeth you're always afternoon, walking past fields mm -hmm. and go ahead and teach them about the fields. And what's being planted and what's happening. And I don't know that because I was not <laughs> raised near farms <laughs> at all. Well, but not teaching them. I mean, again, remembering that. Uh, no, no. To make familiar. Right. You're, you're making familiar with them. You're using, you're using small bits here and there. You're answering questions. Well, I guess I kind of did that. As we drove by the cornfields, I like, hey, guys, look, there's corn. Mm -hmm. And that's about all. We drive by other things and I go, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that is. I don't know. Alfalfa, buckwheat. I don't know what that <laughs> is. There was one that was mint. I asked about it because really? it was nearby. Yeah. It was very pungent. I bet it would be. Yeah. That's interesting. A mint farm. I mean, I guess it makes sense. You have to do it somewhere. Right? Because it is a plant. So... Yeah, so then she talks about flowers. She says, Milkwort, Milkwort, Eye Bright, ro Rest Harrow, Ladies, Bed Straw, Willow, Herb. I did not look any of these up. I don't know any of those, and honestly, I'm okay with that. We do not live in England. Apologies <laughs> no, to you people who do, because you might know what those are, or unless it, they've been renamed. <laughs> or might have occasion to know those those flowers. But exactly. She, she continues, she says, every wildflower that grows in their neighborhood, they should know quite well. And should be able to describe the leaf, its shape, size, growing from the root or from the stem, the manner of flowering, a head of flowers, a single flower, a spike. And, and she continues, she says, and having made the acquaintance of a wildflower so that they can never forget it or mistake it, they should examine the spot where they find it so that they will know for the future in what sort of ground to look for and such a flower. To look for such, oh, <laughs> Yeah, language. So that they will know for, goodness gracious, so that they will know for the future in what sort of ground to look for such and such a flower. 
Oh, gosh. Language. Anyway, they should look at the flowers and get to know them. And then not only intimately, get to know, intimately, right, intimately get to know the flowers, but not just the flower, the ground around it. Is it under trees? Is it in a field? Is it sandy soil? Is it shaded? Is it bright? So that when you go out to a different place, you can find those you can find those places where you know that those flowers will grow and know to look for flowers there. Mm -hmm. Did you do that as a kid? I absolutely did not. <laughs> you? No. No. Um so I looked up Miss Ann Pratt's which so she spelled Miss Ann's name wrong. <laughs> it's A N N E. Nice. Um, I looked up this, her book, Wildflowers, and it's really cool. Yeah? It, it is very useful. It has, like she said, colored plates and little stories about the flowers and such. Interesting. So there's, there's a one side of the pic page as the, the picture, and then there's maybe a page or two about that flower. And, Interesting. And little different things. So, so if would... you're in England. Right. That would be a useful book. Um, so then she also suggests making collections of them to press and mount them on cartridge paper, cartridge paper to both give the kids something to do. A, I'm sorry, affords a happy occupation and at the same time, useful training. And better still is to accustom the children to make careful brush drawings of the flowers that interest them. So in some way... Whether you are actually pressing the flower or whether you are making a brush drawing of the flower to have a record of it for yourself, for that child. Right. And she says, put the English name, the habitat, the date of finding it so that, so that you have a record so that you can look back at it and see these things. Mm-hmm. So next she talks, you know, we just talked about flowers. She moves on to talking about trees. She said children should be made early intimate with the trees and they should pick out half a dozen trees in their winter nakedness and take these to their year to be their year long friends and then observe them throughout the seasons and see how they change in the spring, in the summer, in the fall, and then back to winter again. What does their bark do? What do their, what do their leaves do? Flowers. What do the, how do the trees flower? Uh, when do they get their leaves? What, what, what's the temperature when they get them? Uh, all of, all of those things mm -hmm. to know the trees better. And it, and she's got a quote here, more black than ash buds in the front of March. So that's actually talking, it's talking about the gardener's daughter and it's talking about her hair in the actual poem. Well, but what she's saying is is that she's using – this poem is using uh, the analogy that her hair is more black than ash buds in the front of March. If you haven't studied trees, you wouldn't know how black that is. Oh, that's true. So it's – you know, the author there is using poetic language to describe to the reader how how black her black hair is. And that was Alfred Lord Tennyson again. Shocking. I know. So, you know, that with, with the, with the better study of nature, we can use better language to describe things. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that's what she's showing here. And that's what we, we aspire for to for our children. She quotes him again in another sentence. It's hard to keep pace with the wonders that unfold themselves in the bountiful seasoned land. That's also from Tennyson. Same poem or a different nope, one? No, different one. Huh. It's called Maud. Section four. Well, all right then. So she was reading Tennyson when she wrote this part. <laughs> that I wonder. I wonder if there are any other Tennyson quotes. Uh, I don't think there are. Okay. Well, she moves on to talking about the seasons. She's saying that. We should we should follow the seasons with our children. Keep track of what happens and which which things happen when. Yeah. And Lee Hunt, 
on flowers. Suppose, suppose flowers themselves were new. And he was a English critic, essayist, and poet from 1784 to 1859. And this was not one of his poems, but this was a, I don't know, a speech or something, kind of a, I think it was a talk he gave. A public oration? Yeah. Interesting. I, this reminds me, so I just finished a, a trilogy by the author Brandon Sanderson, who's a, a fantasy author. And the the series I read was Mistborn. And in this world that he created, it's a world not unlike ours, but at some point through magic, the world, what, it moved closer to the sun. And so then whoever accidentally moved it closer to the sun created volcanoes to spew ash into the sky so the sun doesn't burn everything. And then had to change. I guess that's a fix. Right? It fixed it poorly, but it fixed it because um, he didn't have enough magic left to move the earth back to where it was supposed to be, I guess. I don't know. It was weird. But uh, but anyway, throughout the course of this whole thing, they ended up with a world where the sun was red because of some reason. And there was ash everywhere and there was there was very little color in the world. And flowers were no longer a thing. Like they just didn't happen, especially colorful flowers. Hmm. And so there's a scene in the very end of the book. So spoilers, if you want to go read Mistborn, one, two, three, <laughs> <laughs> no to skip the next like 10 seconds. It's a great book series. I highly recommend it. But anyway, in the end of it, there's a scene where, where all of the people, they go underground and then magic happens and everything is set right again. And the people come out from underground and it's spring and they look around and they see green stuff. And it's really weird because everything's been black or brown, but all of a sudden there's green grass and there's colorful things coming out from the ground and it's weird. And they're, they're colorful. They're like purple leaves that are small on grass and it was his his description of them seeing flowers for the first time was fascinating. Hmm. And I really wish I had a, a physical copy of the book so that I could read that little bit. But reading this made me think of that because that was legitimately a group of people that had never seen never or even seen thought that. of flowers. And his description of them seeing them for the first time was fantastic. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So that that sense of awe is is what she's talking about here, the awe of seeing flowers for the first time. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, it it, it was. It was. So yeah. Mistborn. Go look it up. It's good. So then she pulls out that it's the flowers that aren't new. It's it's the children. The children are new. And so it's the fault of their elders if every new flower they come upon is not to them a piccola. A mystery of beauty to be watched from day to day with unspeakable awe and delight. Did you look, look up that word piccola? Yeah, it's kind of like a an endearing term in Italian. Huh, okay. I couldn't get any detailed stuff. You, you Google it and it pulls up Italian bistros. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of not helpful that's and not there's helpful. really no context to figure it out no here. Hmm. okay although i do have the annotated version of home education coming from Ooh, that's true uh, from a charlotte mason plenary and so maybe she has more insight we'll have to look that one up when that comes in that's exciting and meanwhile while we're looking at the seasons and the flowers, we forgot about those trees. <laughs> That's right. She does say that. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. By the way, look at the trees again. That we have taken into a sort of comrad comradeship for the year. And then they have flowers, too. Sometimes their flowers are the same color as the tree or as the, the leaves. But they still have flower. That's and you learn the, the concept of... Every plant bears fruit, fruit and seed after his kind. Yeah, that's true. 
she's like, there's exceptions. There's exceptions to every rule. But right now, right now, what matters <laughs> is that they're learning. Ignore the exceptions. <laughs> Move on. That trees have flowers that bear fruit that have seeds. Just like plants. Bushes have flowers that bear seeds, fruit that have seeds. Right. So do grasses. So do flowers so do ev so does every plant yeah and this is stale knowledge to older people but one of the secrets of the educator is to present nothing as stale knowledge but to put himself in the position of the child and wonder and admire with him i think i think that is the quote that we're going to use later yeah yeah i like that one and I, I like how it ends, too. Uh, she says, uh, let's see, and wonder and admire with him for every common miracle which the child sees with his own eyes makes of him for the moment another Newton. So he sees these things and he becomes so excited about them that he's willing to dive into them and and study them and figure them out as much as he can. Well, I see that as he is the one making the discovery for the first time. Ian just finished listening to uh, The Door in the Wall. And I asked him, you know, what was one of the, the things you enjoyed? And he said it was that the, the boy, Robin, made himself some crutches so he could walk around. And he was, he was like, that was, that was so cool. Mom, was he the first person to make crutches? <laughs> <laughs> like no no sweetie but 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 that idea of he made those for himself like, did he discover that right was he the first one to think of it yeah that's interesting so yeah it's still knowledge to us but to him it's a it's a new idea yeah, it's a fabulous new idea that he can that he can think about so I just thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> so then she moves on to, she talks about calendars here. And, you know, she talked about seasons. She's talking about trees and plants and flowers. And she says, it is a capital plan for children to keep a calendar. The first oak leaf, the first tadpole, the first cowslip, the first catkin, all of these firsts. So that next year they'll know when and where to look out for their favorites. And will every year be in a condition to add new observation? And then she finishes, there's hardly a day when some friend may not be expected to hold a first at home. So by keeping this calendar throughout one year, the next year you can go buy it and see, and, and see when things are going to happen and look forward to them with excitement and anticipation. Mm-hmm. And you can look for them. And then you can record that next year if they happened on the same day, if they happened in the same month, in the same week, where where when in the, the year those things the happened. Same. Yeah. Which is interesting because then you do that for enough years and and all of a sudden you have a, a deep knowledge of the seasons and the plants and the animals around you. And I realize we're not talking about animals yet, but... But I feel like the same hold. Well, no, she did say tadpole. Tadpole. There's an animal. <laughs> <laughs> and and bugs too, because she talks about she talks about uh, caterpillars in a bit as well. And squirrels. And squirrels. And jays. She talks about all kinds of things here in a bit. But I, I really like this idea of keeping that calendar of, hey, we saw this for the first time. Mm -hmm. It's like the birds at the bird feeder that we have. When did they show up? I don't know. Mm-hmm. But it, there's a certain time during the day when they tend to come like two, the, I think there's two times, but I have never actually taken the time to notate what time they're there as a, like a flock huh? because I just haven't done that. Right. And so I can't say, Hey, it's three o'clock. Let's go look and watch the birds. Let's watch the birds come. Let's watch them come in. I put out water for them. Yeah. Yeah, and I think they got into it because now there's food in their water. So I don't know if it was them or if a <laughs> child put some seed into the water. I'm not sure. Well, it could go either it way. It could go either way. But there was a 
um, one of our feeders broke. The the thing that holds it snapped in two. So you can, that it hangs from. And so I just, I was like, ah, oh, just put it onto the picnic table that's right next to our door. Or ne- right next to the window, because I'll, I'll fix it and hang it up later. Yeah, find right, somewhere. And it's right outside it's the window. Like, it's like a foot from the window. And they came to it. <laughs> Yeah. I was not expecting it. They came to it. They they hop around on the table. And so they're right there. They and are. sometimes they'll stay if you're you're still and quiet enough. It's so. pretty cool. We have sparrows and finches mostly. It reminds me of your grandfather who fed the deer outside of his house in Colorado. Oh, he fed the deer and the birds and the rabbits or not the rabbits the squirrels the deer the birds and the squirrels and he just had animals that would come to him and there were pictures of him feeding birds from his hand and every morning he goes out and feeds his pets <laughs> so but they they live more in the city now he, they still have their bird feeders that's good they have four or five of them right outside their little breakfast nook well that's good yeah, and he had to jerry rig them so that the squirrels wouldn't get to them. And of course, he did. Opa has to have something to do. <laughs> it reminds me of the bird feeder we had growing up. That it had a little drop down thing so the squirrels and other things couldn't get into it. Well, the chipmunks figured out how to shove their shoulder in between the flap and the bottom, so the chipmunks would get in there and eat all the food. So mom tasked my brothers and I to kill the chipmunks. So we had a little pellet rifle and we would blast those guys. It was great. That's how we learned about nature. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, is it today that we talk about it? No, it is the start of next week's. So I'm not going to mention that. And your reverence for life. <laughs> <laughs> there was no reverence for those squirrels. <laughs> none. Oh, none. But we didn't we didn't kill just any animals. It was just the chipmunks because they were in the bird food. (laughs) Mom also had a couple birds that she didn't like hanging around. And so she would have us pick those ones off, too. (laughs) So there were squirrels and cowbirds. Those were the two that we were allowed to shoot. We weren't allowed to shoot anything else. (laughs) Only those two. And we did. All right. So uh, nature diaries. So we talked about calendars and that that kind of dives right right next into nature diaries. And I know this is a this is a big Charlotte Mason thing is keeping a nature diary. And it's been called more of a nature journal in today's world. Yeah, I guess journal is more just for people who need uh, you hear nature diary, nature journal they're pretty much synonymous. Right. But you're you're right. The term the term used typically is a nature diary. Journal. That, that's what I, that's exactly what I meant to say and <laughs> did not say it because diary. the word on the paper is diary. Uh so she says as soon as he is able to keep himself Wow. <laughs> as, <laughs> this is great. As soon as he is able to keep it himself, a nature diary is a source of delight to a child. Every day's walk gives him something to enter. And she goes through a nice long list of things he could enter that I don't really want to read. Innumerable mat- innumerable matters to record occur to the intelligent child. And when he's five or six, um, and this is when she says it's quite young. So five or six is like the start. While he is quite young. Yeah. And you can illustrate the notes. So this is something... One of the major hangups with a lot of nature journals, and I have the same one. I'm, we are very, we are not caught up on our nature journals. But one of the hangups is we can't draw, we can't illustrate, we can't paintbrush or brush draw. So what, what do I do? It, the notes are the main part. It's not that you're coloring or drawing or painting every day. It's that you're making notes every day. Oh. And so you're noting the three squirrels in the larch tree. You're noting down that the jay is flying across the field. And then when you're old enough and when you're able to, 
then you can illustrate them. Okay. And so it's more of a spontaneous thing rather than a, okay, now it's time you have to draw. It's time to sit and draw the thing that you saw. But it's more, okay, we're writing our notes down. Oh, you want to color it? Okay, let's color something. Let's let's draw something. Let's draw it. Oh, interesting. So it's kind of a... Which which one comes first type right. thing. Right. Right. And this is not where you teach them how to brush draw. Only give slight instruction. Mm-hmm. Slight guidance. Yeah, the same for mixing colors. You just you give you give principles, not directions. And then they will work at doing it. Yeah. The example she says here is uh he should not be told how to use this and now or he should not be told to use now this and now that, but we get purple by mixing so-and-so. And And then he should be left to himself to get the right tint. It's like, you you, you know, purple is what, blue and red? I think so. I'm going to go with that. So, you know, do you want it more blue or more red? And how much do you add in there? And, you know, do you add some white in there, some black in there? What, what do you, what do you add into that mix to make, the, the exact color that you want, mm-hmm. well, that's up to him to find out and discover. Mm-hmm. And then she gives a little direction with what to do. An exercise book with stiff covers serves for a nature diary. But care is necessary in choosing paper that answers both for writing and brush drawing. Right. So Because it's basically watercolor. Right. So paper that's not going to bleed through. Yeah. Crinkle up. Mm-hmm. I can't stop thinking... I can't make my mind sit down. This poor little girl. Her mind just keeps going and going and going. I know that feeling. And going and going. So we send them outside. That's what I do. (laughs) I tried that today. It didn't work. It did not work. Well, today was cold and gross and rainy sometimes. It did not work. (laughs) I wanted half an hour. It was 1130. It's like, okay, you guys go play outside. There's been enough time for it to warm up at least a little bit. It did not work. Mm -hmm. So this little, the little brain people swarm in and out. So she butchers a quote, kind of. This, this poem she's quoting here? Yeah. This is a poetic aphorism by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. An aphorism is a pithy observation that contains a general truth. So the actual one is... It's entitled, The Restless Heart. It says, A millstone and the human heart are ever driven round. If they have nothing else to grind, they must themselves be ground. So she changes heart (laughs) into brain. Which is why it's in parentheses. The human brain. (laughs) The heart and the brain are two very different things. I mean, it works. Well, yeah. But... (laughs) Oh, that's funny. <laughs> she does. She absolutely butchers that. Anyways, this poor child who can't stop thinking, set them to definite work by all means. Give them something to grind. So they're not just grinding their heart brain. But let them work with things and not signs. And I think this of, you know, let them work with tangible physical items, not with the book that's talking about the item right not don't don't give them ideas to grind on give them things to physically do Mm -hmm. because again going back to what she was talking about in 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 lessons and fatiguing the brain you want to activate different sides of the brain so if your brain is running on ideas then do something physical Mm mm-hmm Get your get your brain and body doing something else so you can switch it off. Yeah. So then... That we, was Flowers and Trees. It was. So then we move on to Living Creatures, which is a field of interest and delight. She says, then as for the living creatures, here is a field of unbounded interest and delight. The domesticated animals are soon taken into kindly fellowship by the little people, which is very true. Perhaps they live too far from the real country for squirrels and wild rabbits to be more to be more to them than a dream of possible delights. 
But surely there is a pond within reach by road or rail where tadpoles may be caught and carried home in a bottle, fed and watched through all their changes, fins disappearing, tails getting shorter and shorter, until at last there is no tail at all, and a pretty pert little frog looks you in the face. We went to the park today, and there's a, a rather large pond, and Ian was like looking in the water, went, oh, I wonder if there's any tadpoles in here. <laughs> it's like, I don't... I didn't say this, but I was like, I don't think that they would be in this one. <laughs> eh, they might not be. But then again, they might. They might. I just, I don't know. I don't know. So I think we are definitely at the stage of having tadpoles would be a good thing. Well, she talks in a little bit about an ant farm. She talks in detail about an ant farm. Yeah, she goes into detailed directions on how to construct an ant farm out of raw glass. So, real quick. Um, yeah, that's getting ahead of ourselves a little. Yeah, backing up. We have always known that it becomes us to consider their ways, the, the ways of ants, and be wise. But now, think of all Lord a Avebury has told us to make that 12-year-old ant of his acquaintance quite a personage. Lord Averbury is a title, and we are now, the fourth one just passed away recently. But he was the first one, John Lubbock. And he worked in archaeology, ethnography, and several branches of biology. Hmm. So, he introduced the first law for the protection of the UK's archaeological and architectural heritage. Interesting. Interesting. So, and he apparently, there was a, a Stone Age place that was going to be um, torn down. He bought the land. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, you're not going to do that. You're not allowed to tear it down because I own it. And then Dean Farrar, describing a lesson about the, the busy little bee, was a cleric of the Church of England. He was Anglican. Oh, this is the story where he's talking about bees and the kids are just... The teacher is. The, he's watching the teacher talk to the kids. Oh, he's watching the teacher talk. Okay, I, I read a that A lesson wrong. he was present at. Okay, so he's watching the teacher talk to the children about bees, and the children are sitting there not knowing what he's talking about. And then he asks the kids, and they're like, well, we don't know uh, what, what a bee is. What's a bee? I don't know what that is. Oh, there are many children who do not live in the slums of London and are yet unable to distinguish a bee from a wasp or even a humble from a honeybee. John does not like flying bee creatures <laughs> it's the wasps i don't like bees i'm kind of, i'm more okay with i've <laughs> i've had some run-ins with wasps over over my life and they hurt and i don't like them the children's museum in virginia had a bee colony oh it did that that was glass on both sides and you could see them coming in and out and and bringing stuff in and the little pollen pouches. And I was fascinated. It was really bees. cool. So it was, a, it was a really cool thing. And they were very, very busy. They were busy, busy bees. Anyways, they should be encouraged to watch patiently and quietly until they learn something of the habits and the history of bee, ant, wasp, spider, hairy caterpillar, dragonfly, and whatever of larger growth comes their way. So all the things that you can sit and watch, they need to sit and watch. I, I like this little example. This little girl says, the creatures never have any habits while I'm looking. Well, it's her fault. She's, she's not seeing them. She's not looking at them. She's not being patient to look. She's just looking at them and then complaining. Yeah. And then in the same paragraph... Somebody should have told her to at least make another paragraph. She starts this whole how yeah. to bring ants home. That should have either been a paragraph or just a whole nother section. Because. Don't do this with fire ants. Just don't. Well, she says the red ants because they're quarrelsome. No, but, get the yellow ones because the red ones are quarrelsome. Right. The red ones are quarrelsome. I don't know what she's talking about. I don't know what ants are in England. If you listeners do, please let me know because. Right. Either that or if you live in Texas, have fun digging up that ant hole to find the queen. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't it's a, it's a know. bad. It's a bad choice. Those suckers hurt. 
Yeah. Uh, so let's see. I So the next thought I thought was interesting. She talks about ants for a while and it was like, you can, the, the, the nest can last for years that you keep and you can watch the ants do different things throughout the season, which is fascinating. But she continues, she says, with regard to the horror, which some children show of beetle, spider, worm, that is usually a trick picked up from grown-up people. I.e. children learn to be scared of these small creatures from their parents or from other people. So I didn't wasn't able to find out who Kingsley was because all we have is Kingsley. That's a last name. But they would come, oh, daddy, daddy, daddy. And they're like, she says, Kingsley was frightened of them, but he did not show it to them. <laughs> and and he let them be excited and chose to be excited with them. And right. they grew up not afraid. Which is a very powerful thing to not be afraid of small bugs and creatures and things. My my hesitancy and my caution with this is I don't know which ones are poisonous. And so that lack of knowledge on my part leads me to not want the kids to pick things up. So I don't, because I know there's, there's caterpillars that if you brush up against them, they'll leave their, their spines in you mm -hmm. and it'll sting and hurt. I mean, I guess that's one way to learn not to pick them up, but <laughs> I, I mean, so I, I'm, but that can also breed fear of the thing. Yeah. Well, so she she goes on to talk about that uh, some children are born naturalists with a bent. In Hold on. No. Oh. After that, enter it in your diary. Mother can write it if writing's a labor. Write what he's doing. Write where you found it. Write what he's the color, the shape, the legs, and then when he actually enters official schooling enters biology he'll come across and be like whoa dude i I, I know that guy i already know about that thing i know what it looks like and what it does and so we talked about that at some point about encyclopedias and how the use for an encyclopedia is not to teach but to reinforce or be a double check and i, I think that's what this is Okay, go ahead with the born naturalists. All right. So some children are born naturalists with a bent inherited, perhaps from an unknown ancestor. But every child has a natural interest in the living things about him, which is the business of his parents to encourage. We've been talking in church about a creation ordinance, something that God gave to humans before the fall. One of them was the Sabbath. One of them was marriage. And one of them was work, specifically work in a garden, work with the living things around you. To cultivate the garden. To cultivate, to classify, to put in order. No, well, that's true. To all, all of these things that you, you do with nature was given to man as an occupation before the fall. So the work of classifying and studying animals and nature and cultivating it is a very high calling. Yes. Interesting. I hadn't put that together. That's why I didn't say it before now. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what I thought was interesting here is that she's saying that, that children are naturally, they're naturally interested in natural living things. But if they see that the things which interest them are indifferent or disgusting to you, the parent, their pleasure in them vanishes. Mm -hmm. And that chapter in the book of nature is closed to them. Yep. And so we as parents can't be dismissive or disgusted by these things. If just, just like we just talked about with this Kingsley fellow, if you're a person who doesn't like bugs and spiders and things, Learn to get over it for your children's sake. At minimum, learn not to show it. Or at minimum, learn not to show it. And and that can be hard to do. Mm -hmm. So, Selborne, The Natural Histories of Selborne, it was written by Gilbert White. 
in the 1700s. He was a parson nat naturalist, a pioneering English naturalist, e ecologist, and ornithologist, best known for this book. And it was published by his brother in 1789, and it's been continuously in print since then. Nice. With nearly 300 editions up to 2007. Nice. It was published late in his life. It's a mixture of letters, a calendar, um, comparing observations of, you know, first appearances of the year, uh, plants and animals and natural history observations. And, you know, if they didn't go foraging, if they didn't go to see this pebbles in the boulders and examine everything, as a boy, would he have written this when he was... 69. He was 69 when it was published. Probably not, because he wouldn't have had that love for it. Yeah. And then the same with, with Audubon, the American ornithologist. Ornithologist is birds. He was born in the 1780s and died in the 1850s. And this one, his major work, a color plate book entitled The Birds of America, was published in... I don't know. It says 1827 to 1839, and it's considered one of the finest ornitholo ornithological works ever completed. That's quite the word. I know. And he <laughs> identified 25 new species. Wow. So. But again, if he didn't, if he hadn't have had that love for birds cultivated as a child, there's no way he would have gone on to do that as an adult. Well, and it's it's that he has the passion. They both encouraged allowed and aided his discoveries yeah. and didn't squelch it. I, I ran across a, a post. It was a Reddit. It was a post on Reddit, but it was a guy who was saying that on his bus ride to and from school, he had like a 30 minute bus ride. And so he would always do homework or he would have a book to read or something. And there was one there was one day where he had finished his book, he had no homework, and he was going to have nothing to do for his ride home. But he only had like two minutes. So he ran into the library, he grabbed the, the most interesting book he could find, and ran out. Well, it was a book on astronomy. Astronomy is the study of stars. Right, astronomy. And he he's like, I read this book, and I became passionate about about the stars and learning about these things. And he's like, when I got home, all I wanted to do was buy a, buy a telescope. Hmm. He's like 30 years later, here I am. I am an astrophysicist. And that has been my life's passion ever since that day when I pulled a book off the shelf randomly. And this passion just exploded inside of me. Hmm. Well, that caused, calls to mind, you know, what she had talked about ideas. Yeah. Chapter four of Parents and Children is the ideas chapter. What is an idea? A living thing of the mind. We say of an idea that it strikes us, impresses us, seizes us, takes possession of us, rules us. And our common speech is, as usual, truer to the fact than the conscious thought of which it expresses. Why do you devote yourself to this pursuit, that cause? Because 20 years ago, such and such an idea struck me. It's the sort of history which might be given to every purposeful life. Every life devoted to the working out of an idea. Basically, the thought is you never know what's going to hit them. Yeah. So give them everything. Right. And that's, that's the premise behind giving them a broad feast. Yeah. Is because like like this guy, you never know when they're going to read a book and it's just going to light a fire inside of them. Mm -hmm. And they're going to follow that passion for the rest of their life. And just like Audubon, Audubon and, and this other guy. Gilbert White. He's not listed in here. Oh, okay. He's just called the naturalist. Selborne. I was going to go Schlotke, but that was wrong. Selborne is the location. <clears throat> oh, well. Sorry. But yeah, anyway, ideas. They're they're powerful. So next we talk about what town children can do. 
And I didn't have anything really highlighted for this until the very end of it is, until the very end of it. Because town children can go outside too and still see all kinds of things. Yeah. What I was thinking about, and I didn't, I forgot to look this up. When did cars become a thing? Like the automobile? Yeah, as an everyday transport for people. Mid to late 1800s? I'm going to look it up. I I don't know. I'm going to say mid to late 1800s because it would have been the, the Model T. That and pesticides. When did pesticides come into play? Because I, you, you look... I walk through our neighborhood and it is very homogenous. One, we have an HOA and it requires certain things That's in your true. front yard. But two, I mean, you have a yard followed by a yard with maybe a different type of grass. What so, you find? uh, Sumerians 4,500 years ago. Up until John. <laughs> John. <laughs> Up until the 1940s, inorganic substances such as sodium chlorate and sulfuric acid or organic chemicals derived from natural sources were still widely used in pest control. So all of these things that you see by the wayside, you can see some of it if you walk around in towns. And but not as much anymore. I, just, You're right. I, I just, I'm finding a lack. The, you, there is. There is a lack of these things in the city. Automobiles. Oh, right. Model T. That was the other thing I was looking up. So, uh, so anyway, pesticides, uh, they, they, through the 1950s, uh, and then, and then on from there, they got uh, a little bit better. They had been, they, they did use arsenic in the twenties and thirties and it killed people. <laughs> so, you know. But that was still post Charlotte Mason. Yeah, it was. Uh, so let's see. The Model T was produced from 1908 to 1927. Post, so, again, post Charlotte, post Charlotte Mason. Mason, but that's the Model T. Cars had been around for for a while. But they went slower. And and just the, the society and the the life structure of of a, a town or a city or of a country was so drastically different. Yeah. I mean, we don't think anything of driving 20 miles mm -mm. because that's, you know. Maybe it's maybe a 30 minute drive. Right. 10 minutes. How does that work? I don't know. I, I'm an engineer. I don't do math. Uh, so the year, <laughs> the year 1886 is regarded as the birth of the modern car. When Carl Benz presented his Benz patent motor, motor wagon, motor wagon. It's German. And then in the 1908 was the advent of the, or was the model T which was the first car accessible to the masses. So between the late 1800s and the early 1900s was when cars really took off. So post Charlotte Mason writing this book. Post her writing this book, but not post her lifetime. But I don't like we were talking, they have the, the odd omnibus or the, the rail. The omnibus. What is an omnibus? <laughs> I never did look that up. An omnibus in the 1800s. It's a horse, horse bus or horse-drawn omnibus. It was a large enclosed and sprung horse-drawn vehicle. So I don't know. It's reading reading through this. You know, hearing the where you go for walks. You take the calendars. You see the flowers. You see the trees. You see all of these different animals doing things. And I'm not sure if I'm not being observant. Or if they're just not that prevalent. If it's because of all the asphalt and the concrete and the sidewalks. Or if it's where I'm going. I, it's just everything seems very it uh, all, sterile almost. Yeah. It almost makes me think that the places to go would be places like national forests or national parks. Mm -hmm. Where you get down by the river. or or maybe old neighborhoods. Or, or old neighborhoods. I mean, I'm thinking even the, the time that we went to the river with my mom while she was still here. And we walked through the river to get to the little island. There was all kinds of stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Because it was non-cultivated land. 
So I guess when in a city, you have to find those non-cultivated areas. Mm -hmm. So. So I don't know. That side tangent there. And again, birds. You you feed the birds in the city and they come. Ours do not in any way, shape or form sit on our hats, our hand or hands. No, but we have not fed them the way this guy did. That's true. Because I'll bet, given enough time, you know, you said that the birds are comfortable with you standing at the window. Mm-hmm. Well, how long is it going to be before they're comfortable with you standing outside? And then sitting on the bench as they fly in to eat mm-hmm. at the table. Like the, because that's the whole thing is that they're, they you just, just grow comfortable with mm-hmm. you as an individual. Yeah, I've got the downside of having five crazy children <laughs> and a dog. So I don't know that what, you that's mean, actually going to happen. You mean they're not going to quietly and calmly walk outside to watch and stand at and see the birds? No. No, they're not. Uh, I'm disappointed in my children. I know. You <clears throat> should be. They're that, that child that says, nothing happens while I look. Right. So children's your fault. Right. She gets to the end of this section. She says, unless you have anything else here. So she goes on here to say, most children of six have had this taste of the naturalist's experience. And it is worth speaking of only because instead of being merely a harmless amusement, it is a valuable piece of education of more use to the child than the reading of a whole book of natural history or much geography and Latin for the evil is that children get their knowledge of natural history like all their knowledge at second hand. They are so sated with wonders that nothing surprises them, and they are so little used to see for themselves that nothing interests them. And the cure for this blasé condition is to let them alone for a bit, and then begin on new lines. So the the children that learn from a book they're, they're, they don't they don't see the the miracle of life. They don't see the wonder of the creation around them. All they know are facts. Corn is yellow. Woo. Well, even reading how corn germinates and how it does, and then seeing it germinate on the that wet pepper, paper towel that you put out with the seeds, it's something totally different. Right. Reading about it versus seeing it. Yeah. And while, yes, you can learn a lot of stuff by reading, it, it's a totally different experience to, to experience it. Mm-hmm. He prayeth best who loveth best, all things, both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. That is Samuel Taylor Coolridge. Ah. Who is a friend of Wordsworth. Shocking. (laughs) So, and this was from The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, which was his longest poem. Nature knowledge, the most important for young children. She says it would be well if all we persons in authority, parents and all who act for parents, could make up our minds that there is no sort of knowledge to be got in these early years so valuable to children as that which they got for themselves of the world they live in. Let them get in touch with nature and the habit is formed to delight in that. She says we're all meant to be naturalists. And it's inexcusable to live in a world so full of marvels and and care for none of these. Mm-hmm. And so we as parents, we have to, like like we talked about a little bit earlier, we have to cultivate that in our children. Well, and this is this is one of the places where she kind of peels back a layer and and shows her true colors. She says, it is inexcusable for us to live in this world full of marvels and to not care for them. Right. So. And and I like where she goes to next, too, because it's not just because your child could become Audubon or your child could become the person who writes the Selborne book. But she says, consider, too, what an unequaled mental training the child naturalist is getting for any study or calling under the sun. The powers of attention, of discrimination, of patient pursuit, growing with his growth. What will they not fit for him? Because who in who would not be served by being all of those things, by being patient, by being able to uh, 
by having great powers of attention, by being able to discriminate between things, like those, those are, those are unparalleled qualities in people. The autobi or the biography that comes to mind is Teddy Roosevelt. He was a sickly child. He had this, this these faults of temper, and his parents, you know, shoved him outside. And he studied, and he yeah. trapped animals, and he stuffed them, and he studied them, and and became president right. of the United States, and that was his start. Yeah, it's it's a big deal. And again, it keeps going. You know, it's especially important for women. For girls. And she says, you know, I, I say he from force of habit because it's the representative way of speaking. It's just how the English language works. But girls who don't learn these lessons through in interaction with nature have have bad habits formed, who has feebler health, who have all of these bad Jeez. things that happen because you don't go outside. She says, moreover, it is it is to the girls, little and big, a most true kindness to lift them out of themselves and out of the round of pretty person of petty personal interests and emulations which too often hem in their lives. And then with whom but the girls must it rest upon to mold the generations yet to be born. Pull it back to big picture. Right? You know, yes, teach your girls, train your girls, let your girls be outside too, because Who's going to raise the next generation? Right. Because we talk about, we didn't grow up with any of these things, and it's hard for us to teach them to our children. How much better will it be for our children who have learned some of these things to be able to teach their children mm -hmm. even better? And so again, it's that generational thing that's going on, which we talked about early in volume two, is it, it spirals upward and every generation gets a little bit better. And every generation has their pendulum swings. They do. Where they, where something it becomes vastly important that two generations later is not important. And yeah. then it is again. And So yeah, let your kids go outside and, and play and, and see things and learn things. And while you're outside with them, uh, point things out to them and be a part of them being outside. The plants and the trees and the living creatures. Yeah, they're all super important. Thank you for listening. Join the conversation with us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Yeah, I think also a new office chair is in order. There are some at Office Depot for 150 Okay, because this one's... Well, you've been breaking it for years. I know. It's older than our marriage. <laughs> I was, so there's I was, that. I was trying to figure out a way to word that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I definitely, I think I bought this chair before I met you. You had it when we were dating. Mm -hmm. I, I had it before I met you. My relationship with this chair is older than my relationship with you. And you're going to throw it out. Yep. <laughs> Without remorse. <laughs>